Good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from Liverpool, the city of Beatles. And thank you for inviting me for this lecture. My name is Dr. Shiv Kumar Singh. I'm a consultant in anesthesia at Royal Liverpool University Hospitals, which is part of Liverpool University Hospital Foundation Trust. And today I'll be talking about predicting the unpredictable, the post-operative pain. So before uh, I start talking about predicting the future, I'm going to tell you a story. There's a story of a young man. He was in his late 50s and he was diagnosed to have abdominal aortic aneurysm. In, in his late 50s, he was relatively fit and well. He was well built, muscular guy. He considered for an epidural thoracic epidural for post-op pain relief. So we did that and it was a successful epidural. He had uh, general anesthesia, artery line, center line, usual stuff, a major surgery. Uh, we used cell saver, so we didn't require any blood from the blood bank. The surgery went very smoothly. Post-operatively, uh, trachea was extubated in the theater and he was uh, shifted to the post-op critical care unit. He woke up smiling, but the next day when he woke up, he was in pain. The nurses checked the level of his epidural, which was absolutely around T4. So they were actually surprised. The acute pain service were coming. They were actually called in, acute pain team were called in. And they said, oh, let's give a bolus of local anesthetic. So they gave a bolus and the level increased to almost T2. But still the patient was in pain. They were perplexed. What could this be? And then they went through his notes they went through his, interrogated him, and they found out that the patient was on buprenorphine patch, 75 micrograms patch. Now that's a huge amount of buprenorphine. They later also came to know that patient had visited the chronic pain clinic because of some back problems. So they decided to uh, reduce the epidural, or rather bring it down or stop it, and uh, commence his buprenorphine patch and put him off PC morphine. Pain wasn't still well controlled. He was getting other uh, simple analgesics. He was able to actually get IV paracetamol regularly around the clock. Because of the kidney issues, uh, which are associated with abdominal aortic aneurysm, he was not allowed to actually have any non-steroidals. The morphine was increased to double strength. And with that, he seemed to actually settle down a bit, but then he developed constipation. That seemed to trouble him a lot. And he was started on you know, some of these uh, constipation measures. And in the end, he ended up having anema, he developed uh, diarrhea, and this circle went on and on. And, you know, his stay, which is normally around 24 to 48 hours in the post-op critical care unit, uh, went up to almost two weeks. So now you understand why we need to predict post-operative pain. Now, post-operative pain is still undertreated. And this has been studied extensively. And despite all the advances, it's still seen that 80 to 85% of the patients still wake up with moderate to severe pain in the recovery area. Poor post-operative pain control is associated with poor outcomes. There is increased length of stay, like what happened in our case. There's sleep disturbances. There is prolonged time to first mobilization, so they cannot not be ambulated. There is increased in the opioid use, like what happened in our case. 
It is also associated with delirium in the elderly. And it's in certain surgeries, the pain can progress to persistent post-surgical pain, which can then progress to chronic pain syndromes. Because the patient can't be ambulated or the patient is requiring opioids, this can lead to cardiopulmonary complications and thromboembolic complications. So what is the solution? The solution lies in understanding preoperative predictors. Okay. Being able to predict where the patient will develop uncontrolled pain in the postoperative period. And then we can apply anticipatory and individualized treatment for these patients. So, what are the predictors of poor postoperative pain control? So, first of all, them is, is a sex, that is a gender. And the female sex has been associated with approximately 30% increase in poor postoperative pain control compared to males. And this translates into almost the females requiring 11% greater doses of morphine in the postoperative period. Then comes the age. So older age, so patients more than 54 years, was found to be protective. So if you are young, you have more chances of developing severe postoperative pain. It has been seen that for every decade of age, there was an associated 30% decrease in the odds for poor postoperative pain control. So both this uh, sex and age are non-modifiable -modi risk factors. We can't do anything about it. And, uh, but this knowledge can be used to anticipate pain trajectories, how the patient is going to progress. And we can then individualize the analgesic requirements in the perioperative period. Then there are other factors like smoking. History of smoking has been reported to be negative prognostic factor for pain control and a predictor of increased use of opioid analgesia in the postoperative period. Now, this is a modifiable risk factor. We can ask for smoking suggestion uh, programs to be initiated in these cases. The next factor that has been studied is depression and anxiety. So uh, presence of depression, uh, whether it is self-reported or measured with a validated uh, scale is associated with the worst uh, pain outcomes. And interestingly, even mild or moderate levels of depressive symptoms are associated with increased odds of poor postoperative pain control. So this is something which need to be taken seriously because presence of depression anxiety is associated with chronic pain as well. Preoperative use of analgesia, especially opioids, has been associated with poor postoperative pain control. And this may be because the patient is already in pain, is in severe pain preoperatively. Or the chronic use of opioids could lead to opioid induced hyperalgesia. And there can be central and peripheral sensitization to the pre existing nociception. BMI is not that much related to pain uh, in all ratio or just about equal to one. So we will likely not go to. Sleeping difficulties have been associated in certain studies have been associated with poor pain control as well. And this might also be related to anxiety and depression as well because patients who have depression, anxiety have poor sleep patterns. So like I said, there are a number of studies uh, that have looked at uh, the assessment of uh, pain, postoperative pain control. And uh, they have been classified into uh, low risk of bias. These are in the green ones, yellow ones are unclear of the bias and the red ones are the high risk of bias. So 
So the factors which have been looked into and seem to correlate uh, with the development of poor post-traumatic pain, as I've already uh, discussed. So younger age, which was uh, uh, seen or studied in 14, 14 of the uh, publications, female sex in 20 publications, smoking in nine, history of depressive symptoms in eight, history of anxiety symptoms in 10, sleep difficulty and BMI in two studies, presence of preoperative pain in 13 studies, and preoperative analysis in six. Now, if you look at the uh, graph on the right side, forest graph, you can actually see that most of these are actually have order issues more than one. BMI is more close to one. So anything uh, which has order issue of greater than one, uh, is associated with the exposure and outcomes. So there is greater odds of the association uh, with the exposure of an outcome. So here they are significant. So how do you define severe post-operative pain? Because that definition is equally important when you are actually looking at the studies. So the worst pain since surgery on a numeric uh, rating scale that the NRS greater than or equal to seven points is considered as severe post-operative pain uh, for the purpose of studies. So a recent uh, international multicentric database analysis of risk factors in more than 50,000 patients uh, came up with a simple risk scoring systems that use four points. So just uh, four things. The first one is whether the patient, if you're a female patient or not. So if a patient is female, then you get one point. Uh, does the patient have persistent pain of an hour's intensity of, intensity of greater than three? Then you get one point. Has the patient been using opioids before admission? Then one point. And if the patient is less than 30 years, you get two points. 30 to 49 years, you get one point. 50 to 70, zero points. So more than 70, you get minus one point. So from here, you can actually see that if you're a female patient less than 30 years of age, you already scored three points. So what do we actually understand before I go on to summary. So it's been seen that patients with uh, more than or equal to uh, three uh, risk factors had more severe pain intensity scores, spent longer time in severe pain, and wish to have received more pain treatment. So I think this simple scoring system uh, is actually very useful. Uh, it is very simple to use, unlike the other uh, scoring system, which are being studied like uh, QST, which are a lot more complex. Uh, this is very, very easy to actually use and uh, can be implemented uh, very easily in day-to-day -day practice. So to summarize the talk, I can go into more details, but are limited by the time I have been afforded. We can always say that the early identification of predictors in patients at uh, risk of poor postural pain control uh, will allow us to individualize uh, you know, pain management for patients that will like, lead to better pain control in patients and thus will lead to decreased reliance on medication, especially opioids in the postoperative period. And increased awareness of these predictors can help in developing personalized, you know, discipline-specific uh, clinical care pathways. So we can have multimodality strategies for orthopedic patients, surgical patients. You know, you can have the specific uh, kind of pathways for each specialty. It will also help in the ERAS programs, that is enhanced recovery after surgery programs, uh, which can lead to increase, sorry, decreased length of stay. And uh, also, if there is a better pain uh, control, it leads to decrease in perioperative medical complications, uh, cardiorespiratory complications, and thromboembolic complications. Unfortunately, there's lack of dedicated research uh, for some of the specialties like uh, spine surgeries, plastic surgeries, ENT. I think these are less studies in terms of uh, postoperative pain control. And unfortunately, as I said in my introduction, acute post pain is very common. 
uh, but there are no standard criteria to classify outcomes. What outcomes are we looking at? And so there is need for future work. Uh, there is a need to develop uh, consensus criteria for these acute post traumatic pain outcomes so that they can be studied better and then we can have better interventions that can be implemented uh, for the specific specialties. And that will lead to better outcomes in the future. Thank you for listening and thank you for inviting me uh, for this talk.